Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. We have a very special program in celebration of Women's History Month. I am Janet Griffin, the Director of Alumni Relations at NYU R Rory Myers College of Nursing, and I am co-hosting this program tonight with NYU Dentistry and NYU Grossman Medical School. We have three dynamic alumni on our panel who will be speaking about the evolution of work as we have moved beyond the pandemic. Dr. Amrita Patel is a dentist in private practice who co-owns multiple specialty group practices in the New York City metropolitan area. Dr. Patel is active in organized dentistry and is a tireless advocate for new dentists in diversity and inclusion. She is a graduate of the American Dental Association Institute for Diversity and Leadership and a recipient of that organization's 10 Under 10 Award, which recognizes 10 new dentists from around the country annually for their contributions in dentistry. Dr. Katherine Hockman is an associate professor at NYU's Grossman School of Medicine and inaugural director of the Division of Hospital Medicine at NYU Langone Health. She ran a prominent COVID outreach program across NYU for which she received several accolades. Dr. Hockman believes the best strategies to support faculty includes authentic leadership practice and validation techniques. Kirsty Toussaint is the senior director of nursing operations and patient experience at NYU Winthrop Hospital and a doctoral candidate at the Fox School of Business at Temple University. Kirsty manages the business side of nursing and works collaboratively with interdisciplinary teams to design and execute strategies that support an organization's mission. Our moderator tonight is Eloise Cathcart. She is the former clinical associate professor and program director of the Nursing Administration Program at NYU Rory Myers College of Nursing. Before we get started, we would like to do a poll for our guests to see what school or college you all represent. Okay, we have a lot of kind of a nice mix of people here. Still have a few answers coming in. Okay, a lot of nurses in the house. Of course, I love that since I'm with Myers, but I will share the results with you. Just so that everybody can see who all's here in, in the Zoom room with us tonight. Again, thank you all for joining us. Um, we really appreciate you being here tonight to celebrate this wonderful panel with, uh, that we have to present to you. Um, also, we want to hear from you throughout the program. So please put your questions in the Q&A and we will get to as many as we possibly can at the end of the program. So I am now going to turn it over to our moderator, Eloise Cathcart. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second annual program of NYU alumni celebrating Women's History Month. We come together tonight as a community of colleagues to mark the end of Women's History Month for 2023. We're very proud of the achievements we women have made in shaping the world and in shaping our work in healthcare. And we know we have more work to do to face the daunting challenges of this time. While all of us have been affected by COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic in ways that we know or may not even yet realize, there is no question that healthcare providers on the front lines experienced grueling challenges that were both frightening and frustrating, and some are still dealing with the sequela of those experiences. Many women left the healthcare workplace during the pandemic as they assumed disproportionate responsibility for childcare and care of elderly parents, and those who stayed tried to maintain attention to their work undistracted by competing obligations. The feminist icon Gloria Steinem reminds us that even in normal times, though most women work full-time in the paid labor force and full-time in the unpaid labor force. We would be remiss not to think about the issues after the pandemic, in the broader context of what is happening for women today, both in this country and around the world. 
In the United States, the recent Dobbs decision reversed a woman's right to choose what happens to her body. We're now aghast, but not surprised, to hear the stories of suffering, dehumanization, and abuse described by women unable to access necessary obstetrical health care in the state of Texas. Last year, only 1.9% of all venture capital in this country went to women entrepreneurs. And women still earn less than men. For every dollar a man makes, a white woman earns 82 cents, a black woman 65 cents, and a Latina 60 cents. And this hasn't changed in 20 years despite the fact that now more women than men graduate from college and from law school, and half of all medical school graduates are women. Having childcare is one of the major reasons women may choose more family-friendly companies for the trade-off of lower wages. A current study by LinkedIn showed that women hold only 37% of senior leadership roles in the United States and choose to opt out of their workplaces just as they are moving into those mid-level leadership roles because of the absence of affordable childcare. For every woman who gets promoted into a senior management position, two will leave because of lack of childcare. Although it was three decades ago that Hillary Rodham Clinton said that human rights are women's rights, and women's rights are human rights, the Secretary General of the United Nations recently said, and I quote, gender equality remains the greatest human rights challenge of our time, end of quote. Those of us here tonight are clear about our purpose to which we remain committed to provide excellent, safe, informed, compassionate health care which respects the dignity and humanity of each person we treat. We know that our ability to do that depends in large part on the leadership in the organizations in which we practice. A recent report by Corn Ferry found that 70% of an organization's culture is determined by the behaviors of its leaders. Tonight, we are joined by three extraordinary women leaders who are connected either through their current practice or through their professional education to the NYU Langone Health System. They have generously agreed to tell us about their experiences in their respective practices, in their workplaces, and share how they plan to shape their own professional futures and influence the futures of those with whom they practice. These three women are the faces of a new generation of healthcare leaders. And although the challenges they now confront are real, we know that they will not shrink from meeting them. So Janet, I think we want to do another poll before we start our discussion with our panelists. Yes, no? Yes, one moment. Okay. This question is, which medical practice area best describes your current employment? I think, I think we've got everybody at this point. I'm gonna end the poll and share. Hmm. Okay. Great. A lot of hospital based, a lot of academic sector, some DSOs, as well as some federally qualified health centers. Okay. Excellent. Okay, so let's begin. So we have three questions, three broad questions for our panelists, and we'll ask each one to respond to those questions in about a three minute 
time span. So my job, the hard part of my job tonight is to keep everyone on track. And I know that I'm not going to have a problem doing that. So let's begin. And the first question uh, has to do with the post-COVID workplace. As we emerge from the dark days of the pandemic, we're facing what London Business School professor Linda Bratton describes in this month's Harvard Business Review. The pandemic will have a lasting impact on the way we work and how we think about work. Companies have started to realize that the changes they're contemplating to workplace practices and norms may be more significant than anything that has happened in generations. So our first question is, please describe the changes that are now happening in your practice setting and talk about how they affect your own practice and how you now think about your work. So we'll start with Kathy Hockman. Thank you so much, Eloise. I just wanna say I'm really honored to be here with, with everybody and really honored to have been invited. Um, I will, I'm gonna have a faculty meeting on Monday and I think it's really important to acknowledge what's happening in the world. The world is a really tough place to be right now. So on Monday, I'm gonna just acknowledge that we have yet another gun violence situation in the schools and to give people a minute or two to react to that. I think it's really important to, to give a little bit of space at faculty meetings to do so. In answer to your question, our hospital, and I'm sure uh, Kirsty and Amrita will maybe say the same thing, we are at record volumes. We are up 30% from what we were last year. And thankfully, this is not COVID related. So maybe it has something to do with NYU being number one in Vizian or maybe it has the fact it has to do with the fact that maybe people didn't seek care during COVID, but our volume is up 30%. We're opening units, we're hiring, I hired an army of new hospitalists to start in July. The hospital is raging to do new innovations, improving patient experience scores. So all this to say is everyone is chugging along as if, they're, as if nothing happened, but it did and my team is exhausted. So I think, and, and, I, and I know that because people are less willing to sign up for moonlighting ships. People have considered other careers in industry. People are pursuing other degrees. So they're buying themselves out to pursue a master's in public health or bioinformatics. Um, they're less inclined to do scholarly work and we're an academic center. So we want people to do scholarly work. At least two women, and this really hurts me, um, did not want to pursue leadership roles um, because they had had enough. So I really see my role right now is to meet people where they are, wherever that is. So my faculty meetings are still over Zoom, even though thankfully the threat of COVID is no longer because people enjoy being able to, if they're not in the hospital, log in from their phone, log in from commuting, log in and not have their face um, be presented. And that's okay with me. My goal is, again, meet people where they are, create connections for people. So as I always say to my three kids, if I treat you three the same, I'm not being fair. And they're like, wait, mom, I don't get it. But it's true. Every person is different. So you really have to know who they are and take the time to know your team and to personalize what everybody wants, because the key now for our burnout, and I'm really curious to hear uh, what Kirsty and Amrita are gonna do, but the key for burnout is more meaningful work, but you don't know what's meaningful to people unless you really sit down and understand who they are and what gets them to, to tick. Um, it's, uh, I think I, is that, I think that's my three minutes, so I don't wanna go over. I but think that, that's, that's your thing. Yeah. But that is just a fabulous response because I think you're absolutely right on the money. Let's hear what Amrita thinks about this question. Yeah, you know, it's an interesting question. Uh, being in private practice and dentistry during this time, I do agree uh, with Catherine, we are super full. And it's interesting, I recently took a position as adjunct faculty at a dental hygiene program in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, because I have a fiance that lives out there. And so I've been splitting my time back and forth. And we are just 
bursting. I mean, patients are people that uh, I think partially did not come in for regular care during COVID. Uh, and also just the volume is starting to increase to the point where they were supporting one doctor there for a while. Now we, they've got two of us and we're full and we're at, this is Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And so you can imagine in Metro New York City, the kind of volume that we're seeing and we track these things and it is definitely getting busier. And the new graduates, uh, they're hungry and they wanna work and they wanna kind of jump right in there. We love that attitude. But I think the other sort of thing to be mindful of is everyone's, everyone's burnt out. And what I realized over the last 36 months is that we've all kind of been wearing our burnout like a, like a status symbol, like a badge of honor. And when you start to talk to people, oh my gosh, I'm just so tired because, and then they rattle off all these things that they're doing. And you think, how could this person be standing you know, in one piece here in front of me? And then you watch them just dash off to go dive right back into it, which is admirable, but you, know, you can't pour from your, your cup if it's half full. And I think as providers, as caretakers in healthcare, we are so driven to take care of others and even more so now than before, I think, especially, like I said, what I see in this next generation of doctors coming out. And that's great. But the thing that we've had to do um, is, again, be more a little bit intentional about how it is that we approach things, whether it's staff meetings, uh, whether it's meetings uh, on councils and committees of the dental associations and being cognizant of offering that virtual or hybrid option. And like you said, meeting people where they are, that's become so much more important, I think, now um, to lend itself to the overall health of the team. That said, I will say that there is still a shortage of support team members for us. Uh, you know, it's very hard to find dental assistants and dental hygienists, which are integral to the team uh, that we run in, that, that we manage. And that's been a challenge as well, to take the best care of our patients without the support of the people that enable us to do that. Um, so it's very easy to get burned out. It's very easy to lose your sense of self. And I think it's important as healthcare providers, as women, as people that wanna do the right thing to, to take care of ourselves as well. And so that is definitely something that we make sure to go over what, whether we have meetings again in our offices or on a larger scale is an important component of what we focus on now. Yeah. Kirsty, what are your thoughts about this? So I, I would have to agree with um, what um, Catherine and Amrita has already said, you know, um, there's a, a lot happened since COVID and it wasn't just the COVID pandemic, it was a lot of social upheaval as well um, that has, that left individuals are very raw. Um, and I think that what a few things have happened in addition to uh, what's already been mentioned is that engagement, employee engagement is um, the competitive edge for our organization. There is a brutal fight for resources, human resources for people. And um, there's a lot of choice in the workforce. People can choose where they want to work, where they want to be, the hours they want to work. They can, whatever they want, they can look out, look out there and they can find it. So being flexible around work hours, um, I think has been very, has been a big change um, where I can recall prior to COVID and prior to everything that's happened in the last three years, there was very a lot of rigidity around work hours. You come into work, you work Monday through Friday, whatever it is, your schedule is your schedule. You, you want to do it, take it or leave it. There's a lot of conversation about what works for you. Um, and I think if we as leaders are not thinking about different types of work hours and work schedules and being flexible, um, where, where it puts us at a disadvantage. So um, that's one thing that's changed. The other thing that's changed is giving people permission to take care of themselves. Um, and that starts with me, uh, you know, in my role, I have a, a lot of responsibility, but then there are times when I have to take a day off. I have to take the week off because I just need to do what I have to do. And I'll be flexible. Sometimes I need to be on email, but I'm out. But at the same time, um, as a leader, I have to create that space for people to be able to take that time to take care of themselves. The other thing that's changed for the better is that, again, with, with COVID, with uh, human resources being our competitive edge, with the social upheaval, there's permission to be yourself and bring yourself to work, whoever you are, whatever you are. 
um, uh, I, I feel like there's, um, at least in particular in our organization, um, more open dialogue around LGBTQ uh, families um, and groups and communities. There's a lot more dialogue around um, um, people who need different work types of, like I said, work hours for um, patient care needs. Um, just building those communities that has really changed and there's permission to have that dialogue. Um, Catherine talked about the one-on-ones. When you talk about engagement, it means something different for each person. So for me, I, if you look at my calendar, my calendar is filled with one-on-ones. And those one-on-ones, uh, in those conversations, we talk about what, what does meaningful recognition look like for you? What does your work week look like for you? What does your workload look like for you? Where's your growth edge? Where, where should it be? It, it, should it be in this direction? Should it be in that direction? Because if our teams don't feel engaged and empowered, it will be impossible for them to meet the needs of the volumes that we just discussed that coming into the hospital and it's, it's completely nonstop, but if they don't feel grounded and planted, none of us can, have, can, none of us can survive. So those are changes, I think, the conversations that are happening more so now than they did three, four years ago. Great, a good, a good beginning. So let's move on to the next question. Let's pick up this notion of burnout. Used a lot. Um, means a lot of different things to different people. But Dr. Christine Sinsky, who is a vice president of the American Medical Association said that while burnout manifests in individuals, it originates in systems. Burnout is not the result of a deficiency in resiliency among physicians, nurses, dentists. Rather, it's due to the systems in which physicians and nurses and dentists work. Burnout is characterized by emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, lack of empathy for patients and others, and feelings of decreased personal achievement. And the following data suggest, as I said a minute ago, that burnout is happening for nurses and dentists as well. Landmark studies reported by the American Medical Association, the Mayo Clinic, and Stanford Medicine show that due to COVID-related stress, the physician burnout rate dramatically spiked from 38.2% pre-pandemic to 62.8%, and one in five physicians, based on, and Kathy supported this in her comments, intend to leave their current practice within two years. Data suggests that the increased risk for burnout and work-life conflict in women physicians has been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Dental offices incurred significant financial losses of over 70% due to COVID, but appear to be recovering, as Amrita said, as people are seeking dental care now to make up for time lost in the pandemic. However, a myriad of challenges arise for dentists about the best ways to provide care, just as Amrita said, as dental hygienists are in short supply and adopting new technologies or innovations made necessary during the pande pandemic requires significant expenditures of both time and money. And researchers at the University of Arizona College of Nursing, one group, report that since COVID, the turnover rate among nurses in the United States was 57% compared with pre-pandemic levels of 15.9%. So that's pretty much a revolving door. Many of these nurses and physicians who do leave their practices are seasoned, experienced, highly competent clinicians who are being replaced by newly licensed practitioners. So our question for our panel is how do you lead your teams considering these findings? What changes have you implemented to keep your teams engaged? And do you think that being a woman allows you to be better able to lead others in these difficult times? So three minutes each, and this time we'll start with Karsti. Uh, so I think being, I'll start with the, the, the last question that you asked. Um, I think being a woman helps me do this work. Um, you know, as women, we go through very silently, I might add, in the workplace, um, different reproductive phases of our lives. So that's the first piece of it. And so as a woman, I recognize that at any point, you can have a, another woman on your team who is either having a different, a very 
difficult menstrual cycle every month going through pain and has to figure it out and come to work in silence um, at any point could be going through fertility issues and have to go through all kinds of treatments and go to different doctor's appointments and all the emotion that goes along with it. Uh, might be um, pregnant, coming to work pregnant and having to deal with that. Might be going through perimenopause, menopause. All of that to me affects burnout and it's largely goes unrecognized and unsaid and kind of sits on the side. So we talk about the workload. We talk about everything that's happening with COVID. We talk about just everything that's happening in the world, but that part of it specifically for women goes unsaid. So as a woman, I feel um, um, that it, it puts me in, in a unique, unique position for when I do have conversations with my team that they're expressing these types of challenges that as a woman, they could feel a little bit more comfortable talking about it and there can be empathy there for them and recognizing that. Uh, the other component um, when we talk about um, newer practitioners coming into the workforce. They have different needs, different desires. They're brand new. They're, um, they're looking for different things in terms of their own career and helping them find the joy in work, understanding the reason why they chose this profession to begin with, connecting them to the practice and keeping them connected to the practice is critically important um, to making sure we're meeting patient care needs, uh, patient, the patient needs where, or where they are. Um, because otherwise, they're sort of coming through in these waves of, of uh, practitioners who are newly hired in the organization. They sort of get lost in the shuffle. Um, they think one or two years, you know, I've got this and I need to move on. But if we don't really engage them and connect them back to why they chose this work, perhaps um, connect them back to again, what what are what are the needs of this patient and, and what's their what's their development cycle, their professional development cycle look like? Are they a novice? Are they an advanced beginner and, and what does it take to get them to um, expert and sort of retain them in the practice so that they can really achieve that goal. Um, I think it's, it's uh, we lose them quickly and then we're, we're, we're faced with having to recruit again and bring in another batch, if you will. So we're in this constant phase and this constant cycle. But um, essentially to me is, uh, as, as a woman, being able to connect with other women um, on that, on, on, uh, around their, the things that affect them around reproduction um, and, and recognizing what our new practitioners need to grow in their practice is key to, um, to, to bridging the gap that you spoke about. Thank you. Kathy, what do you think about this? How do you keep your group engaged? You talked a little bit about that, but tell us more. And how does being a woman um, either facilitate or impede your ability to do this work? So I think of burnout, when people feel like they're burnt out, it's the system doing stuff to them. It's making them feel small, vulnerable, you know, uh, not able to perform their job. So one thing that I try to do is say, okay, who are you? What is your brand? What is your identity? And we could do this. This could be kind of fun in the, in the chat or Q&A. I, my identity, so I, I have went through this exercise and I said, okay, who am I? Well, I consider myself, and this is all hyphenated, a mom, wife, doctor, immigrant, New Yorker, bibliophile, dog lover. That's who I am. I love everything about, pretty much everything I do has to do with one of those things that I just, just mentioned and, and who wants to make a world a better place. So everyone has their own brand and my team knows my, my identity. They know that I go to Costco and I still recycle cans because that's who I am. I'm an immigrant and I don't leave anything unturned. I go and I get my five cents for every can. And my team, that's who I am. My team knows me, who, who I am. And, and that brings me to like being authentic. Okay. So in many, in, in a, this is a generalization, but many men think that you can't possibly show vulnerability. And I think that is such a crock of crap. Being authentic means understanding that being vulnerable is a strength. So I always tell my teams what I know and what I don't know. There's no games, okay? And um, so I, I, and I encourage people to kind of like level the playing field, you know, like not everybody knows everything, people. So like, let's just say that right now. And if you don't know something, that's perfectly wonderful because guess what? We're in a wonderful team and one of us will know. So just don't pretend that you know something if you don't. So. You know, getting back to the woman part, and I'm, I'm not sure about the answer necessarily because 
I think the best leaders are the ones that are just really authentic. You know, again, people mm-hmm. who are able to say, you know, to, to show their vulnerability and to be confident in knowing that you don't know everything. So, you know, people talk about women and these soft skills, being able to understand and connect. But guess what? Those quote unquote soft skills, in my opinion, are the most important skills. Exactly what Kirsty was just talking about. Like you have to know your team, know who's having a difficult menstrual cycle or like me, I went through infertility. Like that's, it's, it's imperative to know, to know your team. So I think it's just as important, if not more important than the hard skills, uh, the quote unquote hard skills, the finance ones, which by the way, we can all do perfectly well as well. So, um, I'm not sure if it, maybe it was because I was a woman that I always felt a little bit like an underdog in, in a, let's face it, a predominantly male CEO, like that, that C-suite is predominantly male. Uh, and I always kind of feel like I'm sort of scratching, very similar to my kind of immigrant philosophy a little bit. So maybe it had to do with all that. But I, at the end of the day, I do feel like you have to just be authentic if you're going to be a really um, effective leader. Yeah, absolutely. And Rita, what are your thoughts about this topic? Yeah, I love all those answers. And I can speak kind of um, from the viewpoint of my team being the the bigger group of, of the new graduates that are coming into our profession, along with the team that I work with. You know, meeting people where they are is difficult until you know who you are. And for a long time, for pretty much the entirety of yeah. my professional career, I had I didn't know. I was searching. I was trying to wear different facades, different outfits, if you will, um, and and figuring out what felt right and what really resonated with me. And I didn't find it. And a lot of that came from societal pressure. A lot of it came from cultural pressure. A lot of it came from being of Asian American descent, but being first generation here with a culture that uh, demands a lot and says you've accomplished, but what have you really accomplished if you aren't married and you don't have children yet? and shedding the weight of other people's expectations uh, until I was able to make peace with all of that and figure out who I was, I wasn't able to meet people where they were and be a truly empathetic leader, which I think is one of the best parts of what we all get to do every day. Um, And whether it's, you know, having honest conversations about prioritizing personal life choices sometimes over chasing uh, maybe professional obligations that are running you into the ground and, you know, it's okay. And being able to say that to someone, whether it was to my team at work or to a group of dental students or to, to new graduates or residents, it didn't feel genuine and real until I made peace with this is who I am. And I don't know anyone, any explanations, you know, I I'm authentically me. And if it took me, you know, 37 or 38 or 40 years to find a partner, that's okay that's okay. And that doesn't detract from anything that I've accomplished. Um, And when I started to tell my story and lead from that point of empathy and meeting people where they were, the reaction and the response that I get is like night and day. Um, You know, I, at the Institute for Diversity and Leadership, one of our faculty there said something that resonated with me a lot. And that was that leaders can have an amazing idea, but until they empower other people to achieve that idea or goal with them, it's not going anywhere. And I was trying to understand over the last decade why I had all these ideas and all these plans and and things in my head that weren't going anywhere. And it was because I wasn't able to authentically meet anyone where they were. And so that took a lot. And I think that the most integral part of it for me was being able to be vulnerable and not thinking, well, my team members are going to think less of me or the people that I'm speaking to are going to think I'm a joke. But again, this was all about shedding everyone else's expectations and the weight of that. And that is what I, that is the the place that I try to lead from now. And I think without going through it, it was very hard, but it was painful, but it was necessary. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Great. Terrific. I would have to, um, just to piggyback on that, Amrita, you said that beautifully, that the best way to... um, engage our teams is, is to lead from an authentic place yourself and, and, and be the role model. You know, if, if my team doesn't see me being real and I can't be real with them, it, they don't know what that looks like. They have no idea what that feels like. Um, and there's a fine line, you know, there's a fine line between leading and being authentic. 
And, you know, as a leader, you have to know where that line is. It's sort of a, a gray space. Um, but I'd rather ride that line, if you will, so that they can see who I really am and that I'm comfortable bringing myself to work and that I don't know all the answers. And um, I can laugh and I can be serious. Um, if they don't see that realness, they can't do it themselves. And, and part of engagement is being able to, to, to be real and feel normal and, and express what's going on and feel frustration one day and, and, and find together excitement in another. Um, and that journey together, I think, is, is part, of, um, part of the journey towards a, a better, a more engaged workforce, if you will. Yeah. Okay. So our next, moving, moving on, uh, Dr. Amrita Patel, our very own, wrote in an article entitled All the Hats We Wear in the March issue of the Journal of the Academy of General Dentistry. And I quote, aside from our leadership hat, we also wear the mentorship hat for the next generation of dentists. The value of mentorship can never be emphasized enough. Paying my blessings forward to dental students is what brings me the most joy. So our question, my, my question to our panelists is, how do you bring young clinicians into your practice? Is what you do different for men and women? And how do you address issues of gender equity, including pay equity? So Amrita, we'll let you begin if you would. Sure, thank you. That was a really interesting piece to write because it did involve putting a lot of thought into the way it is that we process some of these kind of emotions when it comes to hiring, because it's, it's hard to take that out. Sometimes we all still are human and that happens. Uh, we intentionally hire new graduates. And I don't say young because the average age of the matriculant has risen, I say new. So in the American Dental Association, a new dentist is defined as anyone that's 10 or less years out of dental school. And so mm. there's a lot of people that have second careers. There's people that um, had a whole work life in another profession that have come into dentistry. And because that mentorship aspect is so important to us and the story that my father tells is that 40 something years ago when he came to this country, someone gave him a chance. And so it's important for him to give others a chance. Listening to that when I was younger didn't make any sense to me. And now when I have potential team members sitting across a desk from me, I remember the look in his eyes when he said that. And it's just so interesting to see that now being reflected back at me with people that are so excited that they get opportunities that maybe weren't around for them even 10, 15 or 20 years ago. Uh, we are very aware of the world that we live in. And I think that the pandemic has put that into laser focus for us. So whether it's time off to take continuing education, personal time, stipends to take this continuing education, things that maybe we weren't so aware of three years ago or five years ago, it's definitely something that now we talk about first before we dive right into hours or maybe procedure breakdowns. I interviewed for my very first job that wasn't for a parent recently when I took on this position as adjunct faculty um, out at the University of South Dakota. And a lot of what they talked about in their interview process was similar as well, even though technically I was part-time that you know, I'm coming on as an adjunct. And so it was very, it's been very interesting to have been on both ends of this process now within, within the, a small time frame, And I'm proud that I hear so many of my classmates and my fellow dentists are also being more aware of, I guess for lack of better words, that people have a life outside of the workplace. And that's important to allow them to nurture whatever that is in whatever way they need to, uh, but also to be able to be there for them while riding the line, like Kirsty said, uh, and leading by example, but also giving everyone, giving everyone chance, a chance to grow and, and a fair shot to do their very best. Okay. Uh, Kirsty, what do you think about bringing new clinicians into practice? You touched on that a little bit in, in your earlier remark and how important it is to sort of midwife them into the practice in a way that they can appreciate the good in the practice while they're still trying to figure out where they've landed and how to do those 
procedures and techniques that sometimes feel so overwhelming. So the challenges are tremendous of bringing in unexperienced or inexperienced clinicians. But, but how do you think about women, uh, young women nurses, young men nurses, and um, how do you deal with issues of gender equity? Is it something that you think about? It is something that I think about. Um, so the first time that I was exposed to, to this difference was maybe about 2013 or so. So maybe about 10 years ago. And I was in the process of hiring to fill a position. And uh, I had two positions to fill. And the team that I had that existed were made up of about eight individuals and I was hiring two more to make it a total of 10. The eight individuals were all women all right, in the department and I was hiring two more. The two individuals that I interviewed and made an offer to happened to be men. The first one, we made an offer and immediately he came back with a, um, he countered and countered very aggressively. And I was thinking, I can't pay you this, you know, but I, I needed him on the team, you know, so we, we erred on the side of this was the right person for the team and let's work with the salary that he proposed. Second person made an offer, happened to be a gentleman. Again, he countered extremely aggressively. And so now I have a problem because when I looked at the salaries of the women who were already in the department, there was a big difference. So clearly they had started obviously many years earlier, but there was going to be a gap and there was no way, now no one really knows their salary, perhaps no one would have ever known, um, but there was no way I was going to offer both of these gentlemen such a high salary without going back to human resources and saying, we have to do something to close this gap. Because not only, it wasn't that these gentlemen were, um, their salaries were outside of the range, it wasn't that, it was, pretty much within the range, it was just the other people in my department who happened to be women were being paid so low, the gap was wide and I couldn't sleep at night. So I went back to HR and thankfully my HR department was willing to have a conversation about their salaries. And we brought all of them up to match the gentlemen, the two gentlemen that I had hired. One of them was so low, we had to do it in two ways. So we did the first half of the raise. And then six months later, we went back and we increased her salary to bring her um, to bring her up. But that was my first glimpse into the fact that there's something to be said about salaries. And it wasn't just that, you know, the system set them up that way. Part of it too was that women did not counter. So subsequent to that, I had other women who I had to interview and I had to hire, they did not counter. So I saw in my own individual research, you know, um, sample size of five or six, um, that there was a difference. And so I started incorporating in my mentoring, particularly of women, the idea that you must counter, that that first salary that you're offered is the floor at minimum, and there's always room to go up. And if they want you, they're going to meet you where you are, or where you're at, or somewhere where you're at. And that, the, that uh, you not countering or asking for what you believe you're worth, what your value is to the organization, has compounding effects through the years. So where you start now, 10 years from now, 15, 20, 30 years from now, it has an impact. And subsequently it has an impact on your retirement and on the amount of money that you have available for retirement. So I, I certainly do approach um, men and women slightly different. Um, I give everyone the same, the same advice, but again, I, it's really to make sure that, that that gap for women is closed at least what I can do in my own power and capacity. And I remember so many times when you would come into my classroom and really make that point with the graduate students in nursing administration about how, how to really negotiate and how to think about your own value and your own worth as you are negotiating for a new position. It's, it's really important. I, I am struck though by the justice, the issue of justice that you felt. I mean, as you said, you didn't have to, probably no one would have known, but it was part of your own leadership character, I think, to make sure. 
Kathy, what do you think about this issue of bringing young clinicians into your hospitalist practice, which is a new department for NYU Langone Health? And, um, and so how do you do that? And how do you think about issues of gender equity? After the murder of George Floyd, we looked ourselves in the mirror and we didn't exactly love what we saw as a group. And what we decided to change was how we recruited. So in the past, basically I would get a CV, I'd be very, I'd look at it very quickly, I would say yay or nay, and then we would move on. And that's, you know, to a different, to a, to a different group of hospitalists, and we would have a little way of, of, of interviewing. But what I didn't like about that was that we all have this inherent bias. And it's just, it's who we are and we have to unpack this bias. So we yeah. dismantled this whole way of quickly looking at CVs, which is not appropriate. And so now when I get a CV, I don't look at it. I send it to my administrator who um, redacts the name everywhere it appears in the CV. And then she sends it to three hospitals who I, I picked specifically because they're a very diverse group of people. And they look at it without the name and say, we give them a little rubric and we say, yay or nay with this person, might this person be a good fit in their group? And then if the answer of two of the three of them say yes, then it goes back to me and my, my assistant director. And then we look at it and have a conversation with somebody and then maybe decide to bring them in. The whole point of doing this is for multiple people to see it. For, multi, for people not to see the name, because we know that the Johns get called back and the Jamal yes. sometimes don't. And that's not right. So we just want this, I just, again, as I mentioned, we, we, we um, I hired a whole essentially army of hospitalists because we're so busy. And I'm really proud of the diversity that we have in our class and our new class coming in. It's amazing. It's, uh, it's, it's different races, uh, different ethnicities, different sexual orientations. And it wasn't like we were going for it. We just happened to create a different system where we have more diversity than we had before. And guess what? The team feels really good about this. A, a lot of people were involved in the recruiting process. So that makes people feel really invested in, hey, who's going to be on my team? Who might I be working with? Who's going to be the person I'm signing out to next year? So people really love to be involved in recruiting and, and shaping our team. And, um, and we also felt really good about creating a class that's very, very different, very different interests. And so, so that was one thing we did. Um, and, and you're so right, Kirsty. men and women go about negotiating very differently. And I tell my, my female colleagues, pretend like you're negotiating for your best friend. Because if you, I'm, I'm the same way. I could be a tiger mom if I'm, you know, uh, if I'm negotiating for my team, but if it's about me, I tend to melt like a, like a, you know, a pat of butter, which is silly. You know, I know what to do, but it's true. I have this sort of inherent, you know, kind of, um, I don't know, sort of uh, imposter syndrome. Like, do, do they really think that I'm worth this? You know, blah, blah, blah. So I will tell my, my female colleagues, pretend like you're rooting for your best friend. Or you're, you're negotiating for your best friend because that's what you really have to do. Um, you're, you're worth it. Um, so, you know, we usually, you know, people in terms of salaries come in with the same salary because people usually come in right out of uh, residency and they make, you know, the same amount. Now we've offered a little difference compared to if you're, if you have a little bit of experience and we tend really not to, you know, have any differences really in the salary for men versus women. But where you have to be really vigilant is making sure you're not um, unintentionally giving opportunities to men and not to women. So for example, when a leadership position comes up, don't be thinking to yourself, oh, she's really busy with two kids and she's a single mom. So don't, don't even offer it to her because she may not be, she's, she's already too busy. Don't, don't do that. That's not, that's not appropriate and that's not helpful to her. Open it up to the group and see who emerges. And sometimes you even nudge the, your female colleagues. You know what? You'd be an awesome candidate here. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Put your name in the hat. So I, again, like Kirsty, I try to be the same, but a little bit different. Yeah. There's something so inherent, I think, in uh, between men and women. And I'm hoping that that changes with new generations of of 
people coming into, um, into our work. I remember I would have, I had a wonderful student who was as smart as could be. And she said to me, you know, I'd really like to be a chief nurse of this particular pediatric hospital that she had. Pre she said, Do you think it's okay if I say that? I thought, oh my God, if you don't say it, how will anybody ever know? And then I would have men who would come into my program and they would say from the minute one, and they might not have been as sharp or talented as these women who would say, I'm going to be a chief nurse. Tell me what I need to do to get there. And I would always marvel at the differences that just seem to be innate. And I'm hoping that that is something that's really going to even out with good leadership over these next generations. So we have, um, we have one question only. And so I'm going to encourage our audience members to ask more questions. This is your time. Put them in the Q&A if there's something you'd like to discuss with our panelists or hear them speak about. But there is one question and it is this. Do you think there is more gender equity in pay for female healthcare providers in all practices in other countries than the United States? Anybody want to take a stab at that? I do not know. My guess is that there probably is more equity, but I don't know. No, I don't, I'm not familiar with uh, other countries to pay, unfortunately. Hmm. Interesting we, can get, we can get back to the group. I don't know either. Yeah. Okay, while we're waiting for more comments or questions from our community here that we can't see, but you can see us, but we can't see you. So tell us what you're thinking. Um, let's go to another question that we have. And that question is, how do you nurture the inner strength that allows you to adapt to rapid and complex change with grace, competence, and humor. And let's start with you, Kirsty. Um, how do I nurture it? Um, it starts by making sure that my values are aligned with the organization and the work that I, I'm doing is the work that I want to do. Um, because if this is not what I want to do, it's just, it's gonna show, it's not gonna work. Uh, the demands are too, um, there's too much at stake. I'm leading too many people um, to not love this. So how do I nurture it? I'm constantly thinking about, is this what I want to do? Is this where I want to be? Is this the work I want to do? Is this how I wanna spend my time? What's my, what is my, what will my legacy be? What will my life be like? Where do I, what do I want to be, what do I want to be thinking when I'm 90 something years old sitting on my porch? Um, so I'm always asking myself those questions to make sure that I'm where I want to be in my life and I'm doing what's meaningful to me and makes the most sense to me. And then I'm authentic. Can I be in this space and be me? That's the first thing. The second thing is that um, I just, I try to get rest and, you know, take care of myself. If I don't take care, if I don't get eight hours, it's a wrap. So uh, maybe I won't get eight hours tonight because I'm, you know, I'll be going home late, but it's fine because I make sure I make it up. My body will tell me that. I listen to my body, um, take care of it. And I do the things that are meaningful to me. You know, um, again, it starts with me. And if it's not coming from the inside out, it just won't, it just won't work. It won't make sense. People will see it. Um, and as long as I'm fully grounded in where I want to be, what I want to do, I can show up as who I am. Um, the rest sort of flows, if you will. And, and so for me, that's, that's, that's what it start. It's about me. We always say it's about me, but it's not about me, but it's about me. Um, if uh, making sure I'm where I am and I can authentic, authentically have these types of conversations with other people to help them be where they are. And for me, this work is, it's, this is not a job. Um, and it's not about, this is not just, you know, get a paycheck. Um, I'm always thinking about how I can help people be a better version of themselves, 
not just get the work done, how, how can I facilitate that in any way? Um, communication is not just communication at work. It's part of who you are. Respect is not just respect at work. It's part of who you are. Um, so helping teams at least get those small components that help them, helps them be a better, better person and makes their lives better outside of work um, is what helps keep, keep me grounded and keep me engaged and keep me having momentum and keep me laughing and having fun at work. Kathy, what feeds your soul? So I love that answer, Kirsty. So ditto. Um, what feeds me, and it was in my identity, little snippet earlier, I get inspired from reading. And what I, I want to talk about the books that I read. So I created a book club. So I've done this book club now for 10 plus years. I'm, I'm inviting everybody to this patient experience book club. It's open to everybody at NYU. We just met actually yesterday and today, uh, yesterday and tomorrow, the book this month is happening, which has to do with a, it's a French memoirist who had an illegal abortion in France in the 1960s, very timely. Um, next month's book is by, oh gosh, we can't see it with the zoom here. Okay. It's called Heavy by Keith Lehman. This is a black man who wrote a memoir about being heavy and his body and his identity and fitting in. And by the way, it is such an amazingly written book. So I read these books, I share them with 40 people a month in two sessions. And um, I get inspired because it talks about, when we try to bring it back to the patients, like after reading this book, how will I identify more with my patient? Or what can we learn that will make us um, understand our patients or forget about patients, human beings a little bit better. And, um, and I made so many connections from outside my little area of the hospital, just by people in the book club. So again, I will put my contact information in the, the chat or whatever. And I encourage everybody to join because it's really, really fun. Oh, that's oh. terrific. Oh, fabulous. Thank you so much for that invitation. Yeah, I'm right with you. I love to read and it's so it just takes you to another place and opens your mind in ways that you don't even think about. So, oh, fabulous. And Rita, what do you think about this? Um, how how do you nurture your inner strength? So it's an interesting question to ask because it's something that's really dear to my heart. Uh, I have gotten to the point where I can get up in front of rooms and pe of people and on webinars and Zooms and openly say that uh, accepting help from others, uh, whether it's your friend circle or it's professional help, uh, when you're feeling down is not a sign of weakness. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're, we all strive to be great at what we do, but what we're not is professionals in that capacity. And so just like go see professionals, whether it's your doctor uh, in a specific area, a specialty or whatever, when there's an issue, that is something that a professional should handle. And again, accepting the help or admitting that you might need some, especially in our professions where we unfortunately do read some very sad stories semi-regularly uh, is not a sign of weakness. And find your finding peace, and I talked about that a little bit. And one of the things that I get asked a lot is, well, you know, I've logged on to Instagram and this is especially, you know, when it comes to the dental students and new dentists that I speak to a lot onto Instagram. And I see that people are running 5Ks after work and they're posting their meal and their smoothies. And I feel like I'm unhealthy and I'm never going to be regimented. And, uh, you know, but this is what everyone's doing and, and it stresses me out. And I, I got to the point where I was able to say, well, that can be peaceful for them. But if I had to run a 5K every day after work, I'd be really stressed out. It would bring me no peace and it would be the worst part of my day. So, what that looks like is different for everyone. Some people talk with family. Uh, that would probably stress me out a lot because I'd be getting barraged with wedding planning questions. <laughs> but you know, some people go for a run, book clubs, connecting with friends, whatever it is, find what allows you to recharge. And from there only can you give of yourself and adapt to change and everything that's going on in our world. Because again, if you're running on empty or you know, you feel like you need help, but you feel ashamed or like it makes you feel less than to ask for it from whoever it's from, um, 
that isn't going to serve you or the communities or the teams that you serve at all uh, going forward. So that I think is one place that I find it. The other is from conversations and lessons that I learn on my travels. I love travel uh, in my other life. I really wanted to be an Egyptologist. I also love ancient history and I've gotten the chance to travel extensively. And when you have conversations with people from around the world that come from very different circumstances or situations than you would ever encounter, it really knocks perspective into you. And I'll give you the, the 30 second snippet really quickly that resonated the most with me recently. I was in Egypt. I had been before, but the person I was with had not been. And I was paying for a trinket and the vendor pulled out his phone with his little square uh, device plugged into the phone. And we're standing in the shadows of the Great Pyramid and I'm swiping my credit card. And I was like, I'm looking and laughing. And he was like, you know, listen, you can still hang on to where you came from and the traditions of the past, but you have to be able to see where you're going and waved his little, you know, square device in my face and on I went. And that was kind of just an example of some of the conversations that I have and the things that I see that give me that check to remind myself uh, that things are always changing. You just have to be able to have the strength and the internal reserves to be able to adapt. Yeah, great point. Well, we have several questions. Let's see what they are. And I'm going to ask any one of our panelists to jump in if you would like to respond. So here's a question. What are your thoughts on the tension between remote and on-site workers? Should on-site workers be paid more? I haven't seen um, in, I have not seen, a, and I read pretty extensively, I haven't seen any dialogue about on-site workers being paid more, but I do think there's tension between um, on-site workers and remote workers. Um, I do think that we're early in this, um, what yeah. we call, um, uh, what's the word when there's uh, um, research happening in, in real time? Um, when, when, for example, when COVID was like a, a live research, you know, we could see different things. But um, I think we're early in this. I think it, we, we need a few years to see how this plays out. I personally think that um, we will see a difference between who gets promoted and who doesn't. I think we'll see a, a difference in, I think, satisfaction for individuals who chose remote work versus on-site work and their satisfaction perhaps with their career and where they're headed in their career. I just, I, I, I don't know, I get a sense. I don't have a, a horse in the race, if you will. I just think that there will be, there's a lot still to be learned about this and we haven't, we haven't flushed it out completely just yet. One of the things that, that I think about with this is, you know, in all of our practices, so much about how we form clinical judgments really comes from dialogue. You know, you see someone in a corridor, you see someone at a meeting, you see someone at rounds, you say, hey, you know, I have a patient. This is what I see. What do you think? Have you ever seen it? And some of that uh, ability for less programmed conversation is lost. That, that's one thing that concerns me, the socialization that comes from being with people. But there are others who feel very strongly that working remotely is really much better for them. There was just a piece in the New York Times this weekend about how you know working remotely cannot always be the healthiest thing because you don't move as much. So, and other people say, well, it um, gives them a greater opportunity to exercise and plan those things into their day. But I do agree with you that that there's a lot that we don't know and uh, yet yet to come. What advice would you give a woman who is aspiring to be in a senior leadership role in healthcare, but has the tendency to doubt herself? Well, that was Any? me. Yeah. Um, so here's what, here's my little trick. And my trick is numbers are your friend. So when I was the early, the only hospitalist way back when, and I was asked to build the program and say, okay, why is a hospitalist more effective? What's the worst than someone who's not a hospitalist? I would go back to the numbers 
the numbers that the senior administration cared about. Observe to expect the length of stay, readmission rate, early discharges, all that stuff. And I would simply tally up the hospitalist data versus non-hospitalist data and present the facts and say, okay, you decide. And I knew my numbers were a lot better. So um, be object, I guess my answer is be really objective. And then you won't doubt yourself. Figure out how to quantify your achievements in numbers. So maybe it's like, how many people attended your session? Um, you know, something very easy to kind of figure out. Or maybe that you asked for a survey after whatever conference you put in. Well, how did, what was the impact of that? And then there's that soft stuff, like how many people came up to you and said, oh, I was thinking about doing this. Okay, that could be sort of a, you know, a qualitative kind of um, gravy on top. But try to figure out how to objectively quantify what you are doing in a metric that is meaningful to an organization. And, and then the, 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 doubt, the, the, the doubt, which is there, and sometimes will always be there a little bit, will melt away a little bit. And you become more and more confident at when your work can show off for itself. Yeah, and it's like a muscle. The more you practice it, the, the stronger it becomes, I think. Well, here's an interesting question. If you marry your partner, after receiving your medical, or we could say dental or nursing degree, would you change your professional name to your partner's name, hyphenate or keep your own name? I didn't have a middle name. So my maiden name became my middle name. And my husband's name is the name that I now use professionally. And I feel great about it. Same for me. I, I don't know. I um I, I I'm not sure. I feel like it really is such a personal question. I feel like it, it's a personal question, and perhaps the answer is you should have room to have this dialogue with your partner and feel confident and comfortable to make the decision that's right for the two of you that you're happy with. That would be my answer. You know, if you're making a decision that you're like, oh, I really, I'm really not thrilled about this, perhaps that's um, a cue to have more conversations with your partner about, um, about what the two of you want, what you want and how to figure out um, to have a, a happy mutual um, outcome, if you will. Mm -hmm. And Rita, do you have thoughts about this since you're yes. on the cusp? Yeah, and you know, my partner is, uh, he's a dentist as well. Um, and he's been out about 12 years longer than I have. So our middle names are our father's first names. And when we get married in, in my culture, they become your husband's first name. And so at this point, I think that my identity is, is tied significantly into the name and into the professional reputation that I've built for myself. Um, so I think that if we have children, that they would have his name. But I think at this point, keep my name. It's me. Yeah, very interesting. Great question. All right. So um, there's a, a question about how to improve the culture and environment at work. I, I wonder if that question has some undertones that um, the questioner meant to ask us if there was anything in particular. But um, I think we've uh, sort of talked a little bit about that. Is there anything that you can think of that there's more to say about, we talked about transparency. We talked about knowing people, who they are, meeting people where they are, creating environments so that people can practice really well and recognizing that everybody every, is a unique person with a story and trying to bring that into the workplace and meet people where they are with the balance of meeting the organization's needs. That's where it becomes tricky, I think, but that's, that's really what we do. Uh, let's see if there's 
Yeah. Okay. Well, that ends our questions and we are close to the end of our program. So I think I would have um, one question for our panelists before we say goodnight. And that is, what has it been like for you to be here? And even though, as I said, we can't see people who are, who can see us, but we know they're there. And if we could see them, it would be so much more fun and so great. But what has this been like for you to be, uh, to be involved in this panel, uh, talking primarily about women's issues and healthcare? And as Kirsty said, this is not a job for us. This is who we are. It's the work to which we've committed our lives. And, and what's it like uh, as a way to say, sort of put a pin in this and wrap it up? What has it been like to have this conversation? And Rita, let's start with you. Thank you. I think it is incredible that we're at a time where we can have this conversation openly and not feel judged, not feel less than, feel safe, and that we have the tools to create this environment in our professions going forward for the generations to come. A lot of the work that we do after hearing from my fellow panelists is about securing that for the people that are coming out behind us, because we alone can't do everything. And, and getting to the point where you know that takes a long time, but knowing that and knowing that you have to empower others as well, and being able to create this sort of environment where hopefully the people that have logged on and that are listening realize that being a leader, by the way, doesn't mean that you need to have your face on a screen or on a poster or a billboard. We're all leaders in our own way. And it starts, it can start small. It can start wherever you want it to start. But the more that we empower and the more of these kinds of spaces that we create, the better we'll all be for it. And most importantly, the better our patients will be for it, which is of course, um, you know, the reason that we're able to do everything that is that we're able to do. So this was really wonderful. Thank you so much. Kathy, what's it been like for you? I agree that right now I feel like we're at an inflection point. And at one point, I really feel hopeful and inspired that women are going to be asked and deserve top positions in healthcare administration, whether that's nursing or dentistry or yeah. medicine. And I'm really hopeful and inspired, again, after hearing my co panelists and you, Eloise, by the way, that we are going to get there. And I'm also just so grateful that, you know, we have, I feel like, I, I feel like we owe so much to the women who came before us, right? It, it was so hard back then. I'm thinking back to some of my mentors who are a generation uh, older than I am and what they had to go through to, to get where they are and that they all, they lifted me up. So I'm hopeful and I'm, I'm inspired. And I also agree with, with Kirsty that this is not a job for me. This is a passion. And part of that passion is getting the next generation, hopefully the people on the call, up higher than we have been. Yes, absolutely. Kirsty, bring us home. Well, first, let me say that I am humbled to be invited to speak on this panel. Um, I don't take that for granted. And I'm blessed that I've had the experiences that I've had um, and wonderful mentors who have helped get me this far. Um, so both in my personal life, um, as well as my professional life. Um, so having this conversation on this panel, um, like I said, I don't take the conversation for granted. You know, there's so many women out there who are looking and watching and looking for inspiration and looking for a reason to continue. And we still saw the question about, you know, doubting yourself. And there's so many women in, in their own spaces who don't realize that they're not alone, that there are other women around them who have walked a similar pathways and similar journeys that they could reach out um, and ask a question and reach out for support. So th those are the things that are you know, crossing my mind in having this conversation that um, I'm grateful to be here to have this conversation, to pay it forward um, and to serve as a as a as inspiration, you know, for others who might come come behind me, and I'm just really thrilled to be on this panel with my co-panelists and Rita and Catherine. I'm inspired by both of them, and I'm thinking, gosh, I, I need to read more. I need to do more. I need to write this article, or, 
all these things. Um, so, so those are the things that are coming through my mind. I'm just really, really grateful to be here and thank you for inviting me to be on this panel. Well, thank you to three extraordinary women. I feel great knowing that you are out there and this is your time, this is your day. And I know that every one of you will do absolutely great things. And thank you so much to everyone who has joined us tonight. And I hope you brought a glass of wine and enjoyed our conversation. And until next year, we will say good night to you. And thanks so much for joining us. Bye-bye. Good night. Thank you. Thank you very much.